you're tuning in today. Thank you for joining us on this presentation as part of the ICAA webinar series. My name is Georgia Maceos and I'll be hosting you today as we go through some great education and hopefully something really valuable for all of you to take away um, as you're training and leading the world with active aging participants. So I just want to give you guys some of the background information to help you through this presentation briefly. If you have any technical issues, you can't hear us, you can't see the slides or whatever the case is, there's a technical assistance phone number showing up on your screen right now. They're very helpful, so feel free to give them a call. They can troubleshoot it for you. If you have questions for our speakers throughout or comments or any feedback, there's a chat box that you can type into. I'll monitor the questions as we go through so that we can answer them all at the end and make sure that we capture everything. Um, this presentation is being recorded today, so it will be available on the website within a few days in case somebody else that you know really wanted to come and they couldn't make it. So that is about it for me. I'm going to do a brief introduction on our speaker and then I'll let him run the show. So today we've got Kurt, Kurt Stork as our presenter. He is the Director of Rehabilitation Services for Premier Surgical Institute and Ortho Four States Physical Therapy and Aquatic Rehabilitation in Kansas. I'm going to turn it over to Kurt with this wonderful presentation on benefits of aquatic strengthening for the aging population. Thank you, Georgia, and I, I want to thank um, ICAA for allowing me to present today, as well as um, Kyla HydroWorks. Um, I'll, I'll start today by um, letting you guys know that, that the presentation is benefits of aquatic strengthening for the aging population. And the great thing about the aquatic setting is most of the things we'll talk about today can not only be carried over in an aquatic setting, but also on land. And so it's not always necessary that you have a pool accessible every day, but that many of the same things you're able to do on land um, can be done in an aquatic setting, and there's additional benefits that we'll talk about. A little bit about me, uh, I've been a physical therapist for 23 years. Uh, 20 of those years have been an outpatient orthopedic um, and sports medicine as um, well as having an aquatic uh, pool uh, for the past nine years of the setting we're currently in. Um, my wife is actually a physical therapist and she is an aquatic certified uh, physical therapist um, and we have uh, three of those therapists here at the clinic. Um, we have three children and um, probably our favorite family member, a Labrador. Um, there is there is a picture of my kids and uh, my dog who uh, spends a great deal of time in the pool, so um, we, we spend a lot of time in the pool as well. Uh, a little bit about our facility. We opened in 2009 at my current facility. We had a 1100 uh, a pool which has one treadmill and an exercise area. Um, we had an incredible overwhelming response from our community. Um, in which we had to actually knock out a wall on our clinic and build a second, much larger pool that has two treadmills and a much larger exercise area uh, because of the response um, from our, uh, primarily our geriatric and post-surgical patients. Um, we see over 6,000 aquatic visits per year and have 18 therapists. Um, we also run a community wellness program for people that have been discharged from therapy that want to continue their strengthening in an aquatic setting. Let's talk about aquatics and any kind of exercise for that matter. Um, safety is, is very important in any program that somebody starts and it's really important that you know your medical conditions and talk to your physician prior to initiating either a land-based or aquatic exercise program. Um, you definitely need cardiac clearance with our, with our aging population. Um, we're becoming more and more active and there's more and more groups and opportunities to not only strengthen and exercise and improve your endurance, um, but improve your quality of life and thus um, the other medical problems that go along with it need to be checked out by your physician prior to initiating a program. Um, exercise and target heart rate, um, there's a, 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 a chart here and something to kind of think about 
can improve your physical fitness and endurance as well as strength, whether it be a cardiovascular program or a strengthening program, um, you want to hit a target heart rate zone of 50 to 80 percent of your max. Um, there's a pretty easy little equation in which you take 220 and subtract whatever age you are and then multiply that times 50 to 80 or, or work within 50 to 80 percent, 85 percent of that. And so um, depending on how old you are, basically um, take 220 minus your age and then um, find 50 to 85 percent of that to gain benefit. Um, some studies about, uh, there was a recent study in 2017 um, in, the, in the Journal of Hypertension and it, it took um, older women um, with high blood pressure and it basically put them through an aerobic exercise program. And 24 women who were over 70 and had high blood pressure were assigned to 45 minutes of land or water exercise sessions and they were split. And basically when blood pressure was measured after the activity, they found that the anti-hypertensive um, benefits of water were comparable to that of land. And so you're able to get the same benefit whether you're doing it in land or in an aquatic setting. Um, a great picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger um, when he was a young man. Um, he's, he's now still out there exercising in California, I believe. Uh, but it talks about strength training. Um, and also known as weight or resistance training. Um, it's an activity designed to increase your muscular fitness by exercising specific muscles or muscle groups against an external resistance. And it, it's important that you understand the external resistance can be a dumbbell, it can be a band, it can be um, a shopping cart. There, you can use many things um, to act as weights, and so it doesn't have to be something in which you go out and spend a great deal of money to, to outfit your home or area with a, a you know a complete fitness center um, when you can you can get a bag of sugar that weighs five pounds and you can use that as a dumbbell and so people are pretty creative in their in their exercises the American Heart Association recommends that the elderly perform at least 90 to 150 minutes of aerobic or resistance exercises per week. And so, you know, doing the quick math, um, that's three to five days of 30 minutes of aerobic or resistive exercise every single week, um, trying to put yourself in the optimal fitness and strength. Um, additionally, we talked about using different things for weights. In the pool, um, we also can use um, the TheraBands, we can use water paddles, um, a piece of foam works really well for resistance, and then they have specifically designed um, water dumbbells, water cuffs, weights, um, and, and things that don't rust and have a, a plastic um, coating. So there's a great study about strengthening in the elderly and it talked about patients over 60 years old um, and that they can increase their muscle strength, increase their muscle mass, and increase recruitment of motor units. And a motor unit is simply basically a nerve and the muscle fibers that it controls. And so um, it's important that we are able to recruit a greater number of motor units and increase their firing rate to promote strength and endurance. Um, it, it needs to be increased through training at an intensity of 60 to 85 percent of your maximal voluntary strength. And so what you need to understand is you don't have to push at your maximal effort to get stronger. Um, there's benefit from any and all strengthening, but if we want to really increase muscle mass, and that's very important, especially in the age population we're talking about, we want to go in and we want to try to push hard enough or lift heavy enough to make that change. And an example would be if, if someone was able to do a bicep curl with 10 pounds and it's very strenuous, that's about the most they can lift once or twice, then we would be able to drop down and use a six pound dumbbell and 
do that five, six, seven, eight reps, and, and that would be 60% of your max to increase that strength. Um, and, it's, it, and as we start training, you'd want to start with the lower portion of that, 60% of your max, rather than trying to do 85% of your max. Additionally, a lot of people will compensate. And so if, if you don't know what a bicep curl is, that would be simply letting your arm hang down to your side and then bending your elbow. That's a bicep curl, working the bicep brachii. If, if you're going to try to do your max on that, if you start to pull your, bend your elbow and lean back forcefully, you're going to be able to use momentum of your trunk and your knees and your legs to get that weight up. And that's not going to develop as much strength as if you were to control that, maybe put your back up against a wall or stand stationary to where you're not using momentum um, to, to gain that strength. Excuse me. Benefits of strength training. Um, a really important one is to maintain bone density. Um, a great number of men and women, but especially women, um, have bone density issues, um, osteoporosis, osteopenia, and um, it, it, the forced resistance actually helps you to maintain bone density and create bone mass. So that's why resist, one of the reasons resistive training is so important. Um, the other, another reason is we can improve our balance, our coordination, and our mobility. And as, as we're aging, um, our inner ear um, balance has decreased because the, the cannulus inside the ear has diminished in its, its function. Um, our sensation has decreased. Our muscle mass has decreased. Our vision has decreased. And, and, and all these things combine to make us at more risk to fall. So we can offset that somewhat by making ourselves stronger so that when we get up out of a chair, we're not getting off balance because our muscles are able to control those forces versus having to stumble or stagger to get up. Thus, the reduced risk of falling um, is, is very, very important. Um, and we're able to increase patients' energies level. If you feel like getting up more and being more active, you're in the community more, thus leads to increased social interaction and decreased pain. Um, the other benefit there is with decreased incidence of fractures, with improved state safety, um, you're going to be less likely to fall, less likely to go into a hospital or nursing home. Um, so strengthening is especially important for people with health problems. Um, as we get older, um, many of us have us are experiencing golden years. Um, I had a patient tell me the other day that the golden years required him to have a whole bunch of gold to pay for all the things that are going wrong with him. Um, and I, and I, it kind of took me back and I started thinking about it and there's some truth to that. Um, and so people with arthritis, um, exercising in the aquatic setting reduces pain and stiffness, increases strength and flexibility, and also on land. Um, a diabetic patient, um, which is one of the, the largest health problems in America, in, improves the glycemic control and is important. Uh, again, building bone density and reducing risk fall, re reducing risk for falls with an osteoporosis, um, reducing cardiovascular risk, um, improving your lipid profiles and overall fitness level. And I think this one in America especially is very important. Obesity, um, increasing your metabolism. Um, which helps burn more calories and controlling um, long-term weight issues. Um, people don't understand um, how much um, obesity affects America, but I'll give you an example, and especially for orthopedics. Um, one pound of increased body weight is the equivalent of four pounds of increased load at your hip and knee joints. And so a 10-pound weight loss is going to reduce the pressure and stress at the hip and knee joints by about 40 pounds. Additionally, with arthritis, you are less likely to require a knee replacement or a hip replacement and, and reduce those stresses. And for the more active people that are playing tennis and running and, and doing things like that in geriatrics, um, that's, it's really, really important because now the stresses as you move faster and the, the, the movement is more dynamic, there's markedly increased loads because 
running is going to increase your load to a joint four times what just walking would. So it's very important. Um, many people have arthritis, um, have limited ability to participate and or desire to exercise. And it's kind of that snowball effect. It keeps getting bigger and bigger as it goes downhill. As you become, have more arthritis, you have more pain, you're less likely to want to exercise, you hurt more, then you, then you have increased weight gain and it sort of snowballs on people. So they're missing, people, that, that group is missing out on the benefits of strengthening. Um, if you have increased muscle mass, you have better control of external forces, less stress to the joint, better function, and less pain. A um, couple arthritis facts. Um, it, arthritis comes from the Greek word arthro and um, itis is inflammation. Um, women are more common or more likely to have arthritis than men at about a 25 to 18%. Um, there's strong evidence to um, indicate both endurance and resistance, strengthening um, exercise can, are considerably effective and beneficial for people with osteoarthritis and other rheumatic conditions. Um, it's a mo osteoarthritis is different than rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is more of a um, localized single joint or multiple joint, whereas a rheumatoid arthritis is actually a test you get, you take a blood test to define a systemic problem where your body's attacking itself. Um, there are over 27 million people um, with, with osteoarthritis and chronic diseases. So creating healthy bones through exercise. Regular weight bearing is imperative for you to have healthy bones. And regular weight bearing with strengthening can help to prevent osteoporosis, osteopenia, and other um, bone loss. Um, stronger bones lead to a stronger muscular skeletal system and this allows you to return and maintain your activity level in the community and recreationally. Um, even more important, the Center for Disease Control reports that one out of every four adults over age 65 falls every year. And that's pretty staggering when you think, if, if you look around your peer group and all your friends, every person that you, I guess, every person over 65 has about a 25% chance to sustain a fall. It's the number one cause of death in people over 65 is falls. Um, and I, I believe there's over 29 million falls annually, resulting in over 3 million ER visits annually in America. And so strengthening and balance and whether that be an aquatic setting or land-based is imperative for this age group and population. Improve balance. Uh, so regular strength training leads to improved balance, muscle control, and you're less likely to fall as a result of that. Um, it's really important because another, another thing that's very important is there are studies that show that, and there's different age groups, but women 65 through 69 who have a hip fracture um, after a fall are five times more likely to die within one year than those that don't sustain a hip fracture. And so if you think about it in those terms, um, working on your balance, increasing your strength, and making sure that you don't fall is, is very, very important in this population. Um, when your muscles are stronger, the connective tissue around them is stronger. Um, it, it means the entire musculoskeletal system is bolstered, providing protection against injuries caused by weak ligaments, tendon, and muscle fibers. Additionally, if you're to fall and you have increased muscle mass, you might be able to not only control the fall better and maybe set yourself down, but you have some additional protection of, of soft tissue muscle versus the fracture um, occurring due to just lack of control. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Strengthening and aquatic strengthening. Um, finding ways to make an aquatic strengthening program part of your day is very important. Make it a routine, make it something that you do, and make it something fun. If, if you can get a group or a, either friends or a class, um, people are more likely to participate when they have 
um, some accountability to friends or other people within the class. And so I think making it fun is very important. Um, so all the studies show that if you exercise and perform strength training and endurance training, uh, you'll have improved self-confidence, um, there's decreased instant depression, um, improved sleep, and I think that goes a long way towards um, your immune system being better, um, you being healthier, um, happier, having less pain, and improved personal satisfaction. Um, 83% of the people in the study I'm going to talk about right now had decreased joint pain and 50% had better sleep and flexibility um, by getting into an aquatic therapy um, program. And so just doing five weeks of an underwater treadmill, um, two days a week for 40 minutes and performing exercises, um, like I said, had an 83% improvement in decreased joint pain and 50% improved sleep and flexibility. Now, obviously not everyone has a aquatic treadmill um, available to them, but you don't necessarily need an aquatic treadmill. During the summer months, uh, many of my patients um, stop coming to the wellness program and they buy one of those pools that they sell that um, you put up um, and has a little pump with it in their backyard. I think they're a couple hundred dollars and they just walk circles in it in, in chest deep water and so um, they're able to go four or five days a week for 40 minutes of walking and they'll bring friends over and so it can be a YMCA walking in the shallow area, it could be um, any local pool indoor or outdoor um, depending upon the time of the year but you can, you can be successful in a lot of different mediums and a lot of different areas. Um, and then there's a, a great study out um, about the efficacy of, of performing walking and exercise in la on land versus um, in the pool for an obese adult. So sometimes we, we do have some people that get deconditioned and, and they've gotten past the point of feeling comfortable and it's difficult and painful uh, to start a walking program at home and so they, they feel frustrated and so this is a great medium to de-weight and we'll talk a little bit more later about how much you can de-weight a joint and, and reduce the pain to allow you to walk and to allow you to walk for duration because if your knees hurt or you have arthritis or um, you have weakness and you're not able to walk um, on land for more than a few minutes then you're not it's going to be difficult to gain the benefits you need and so the, the study here showed that underwater treadmill um, walking performed um, was very comparable to land-based programs and actually um, developed more lean body mass walking on an underwater treadmill compared to land-based. The body mass index, um, your fat body, body fat percentage, and waist hip ratio were all reduced significantly and it's it lowers your risk of injury, pain, and improves compliance and ability to, to, to participate. And so I think that's, that's imperative is, again, you've got to be able to be able to want to do it and be able to do it. Um, so here's a, a picture of one of our pools and, and um, some of our patients and therapists working with them. And um, if you do have a, a community resource that has a wellness program, uh, with a pool, um, it, it's amazing. It, the difference in ability to walk, um, whether that be somebody that's deconditioned, somebody that has balance issues, someone that has arthritis issues, someone that's post-operative, or the higher level patients, the people that want to maintain their athleticism, the people, that, the weekend warriors that want to go play squash or golf, um, or they want to still be able to play tennis and they're in their 60s and 70s. Um, it's a great way to maintain strength and be able to continue training more aggressively than you would be able to on land due to some, some health um, deficits, some arthritis or some joint pain or some muscle soreness. And so um, it's a great way to strengthen and maintain that level of fitness and strength. Um, contraindications. We do need to talk about some things you, you don't want to do when to go into an aquatic setting. And again, when you're doing a, a presentation like this, um, you want it's a it's a, somewhat of a generalized aquatic uh, program, 
So you need to make sure you understand if you have cardiac failure or unstable angina, a cardiovascular system is compromised, um, unstable blood pressure issues, um, absolutely epilepsy, excuse me, um, and, and, and there's a whole list here. Um, uh, some are common sense, uh, bowel incontinence, scabies, um, but you don't want to have a contagious or waterborne infection, an open wound, um, fever or vomiting, and get into the aquatic setting. So, again, if you're in a, in a formalized program, say at a fitness center or YMCA, then they're going to talk to you about this. But if you're going to do your own, then you need to, to know what these things are. And severe hydrophobia is just fear of the water, which is, seems like a lot of common sense. Um, Water buoyancy is basically the float. Um, that's, buoyancy is something that's very important to our, our aquatic principles. It decreases the amount of weight that the articulating surfaces of your ankle, hips, and knees, and pelvis are, are receiving. Also unloads the spine. Makes it much easier and less painful to exercise. Um, we also have the hydrostatic pressure, which is that pressure of the water up against your skin. When you push your arm down into the water and you get deeper, that increases. Um, it, that will assist in helping decrease swelling. Um, also, to allow you to feel your joint position awareness and space. Um, the water warmth um, also relaxes muscles, vasodilates vessels, and increases blood flow to a sore, injured area um, or something where you've worked out and have lactic acid post-injury or post-surgical. Um, there is a difference in temperatures between a therapeutic pool and a, um, a community pool. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, viscosity of the water is the resistance, so that's when you push your arms up and down against the water. If you do it very slowly, you don't feel much resistance, but if you forcefully pull your hands up or down, you're going to feel markedly more resistance. Uh, really important principle in um, strengthening to allow you to get stronger and to achieve your goals, really. Um, warm water, uh, we're in a therapeutic temperature of a pool, which is um, in that 92 degree range. Um, people love that, that have arthritis, that have uh, joints, aches, and pains. Um, if you're a more, if you're an athlete that's wanting to go out and swim several miles, you want a cooler pool so you, your body temperature doesn't heat up. Um, I think improved morale and confidence is um, established by providing a positive meeting with a function so people that can't do quite as much can do more in the pool. Um, and you can be challenged beyond their limits of stability um, without the fear of consequence of falling, which we talked earlier about the potential for fracture, and, and so there's, um, you're able to do that in the pool. And so if you get off balance in the pool, you basically float. If you get off balance on land, you fall and uh, could potentially sustain an injury. Um, obviously, improving functional independence is important. Um, hydrostatic pressure, again, helps decrease swelling, promotes circulation, accelerates healing, and improves nutrition um, through blood flow to an injured or fatigued area. Um, we kind of talked about the buoyancy. Um, it does act also as a support for the spine and extremities, um, which is really important. Um, helps with postural correction, so you can tell when you're when you're leaning with less comfort and discomfort, um, with less effort and decreased discomfort, um, and it provides resistance to our movement. So we talked about water decreasing the load to the joints. Um, when you stand in water at waist level, 50% of your body weight is deloaded, obviously through the ankles, hips, and knees. Um, when you get up into a chest level, it's 75% of your body weight approximately, and not many of us are exercising this level, but we, we are capable of it. Is if we bring it up to above, just above your shoulders, it's taking 90% of the load off you, of, of your joints. And so that gives you an idea of the difference and the amount of load and control that's required for your spine, your hips, your knees, and your ankles with activity. And what we do a lot of times is we'll start people in mid-chest level water um, as they start strengthening, and then we'll move them to a higher setting or we'll drop the water level down to waist level. So we're, we're tiering that program to gradually increase the amount of load 
um, without increasing soreness and pain so that when people want to ch transition from the water or do it less frequently, so they want to now go, from, instead of five days a week in the pool, they want to be two days on land and three days in the pool, they're transitioning towards something more aggressive. And they're seeing the benefits. They're now able to go walk in the community in the park, go to their grandkids' Uh, football, baseball, basketball, volleyball, whatever games they are they want to get to and, and climb those bleachers and not be fearful of falling. And so that's very important as well. Um, kind of figure out what's best for you. The water temperature, a thermal neutral uh, pool temperature is about 89 to 92 degrees. Um, benefits of warm, again, it, it, it decreases the guarding, decreases the pain, it's comforting, it's relaxing, vasodilation. Um, if it's too cold, patients become cold, they get increased tone and fatigue. But if it's too warm, it's difficult for a patient to, to um, lose heat and their, their core temperature can rise. And so again, in that patient that's exercising aggressively, that they might want to choose a setting that has a cool, cooler pool. Um, for most people, the thermal neutral is good and more comfortable. And I, I think we all like getting a little warmer pool than a colder pool whenever possible. Um, great study was done, I believe at Texas A&M, um, showing that walking in waist deep water at two miles an hour is the equivalent of walking at four miles an hour on land. And, and that's a big difference. Um, when, when you walk at four miles an hour, that's a brisk walk for a um, middle-aged person. And so being able to slow that down and, and work against the resistance gives you the benefits of walking um, at a faster pace and for calorie, um, for, for um, burning calories and for creating strength. Um, again, people can't develop endurance on land due to their functional limitations and inability to tolerate participation, so this allows them to improve and then transition. Also, very important in our population that we're talking about, the ability to stay in your own home, stay in your own community, and not have to go to an assisted living or um, nursing home. All right, so strengthening. The pool, using those principles we talked about aquatic setting, the pool, you can start with using just your limbs for resistance. The other thing about that is you can go as, uh, the, the quicker you move your limbs against the water, your, so let's say you're doing, pulling your arms up and down, you can create a very small amount of resistance by pushing them very slow, or you can create a large amount of resistance by forcefully pulling your arms up and down. Um, the faster the movement is, the greater the resistance, and then you can go and increase resistance by, uh, we call them fins, but they're just something we hook around your ankle that creates a resistance to the water. Um, they have uh, a styrofoam type foam dumbbell. Um, we have weights. Um, and there's all kinds of aquatic equipment out there um, that you can, you can utilize at most facilities and or purchase online um, at any online store. Um, Amazon has a whole store for that. Um, so resistance is present with all movements in the aquatic setting. And if you recruit larger muscle groups, you burn more calories. And so that's going to be things like a squat or a step up or pulling your arms up and down versus smaller muscle movements, maybe you're bending your wrist forward and back against the water, is not going to burn as many calories, but will isolate the smaller muscle groups. Um, all exercises in the pool can be advanced um, and, and create more resistance um, and more advanced things like planks and board pulses and fins and things like that. I've got a little video. Um, I'm going to get the button to play here. And this is going to take you from somebody walking on a treadmill, um, and it's just going to show you some different things in the pool setting. Um, the, the nice thing about this video, it's about a minute long, it's going to bounce around a little bit between some different things, but it's going to kind of show you this person's in just below chest height water. And again, you don't have to have a treadmill. You can, you can walk forward across a shallow area of a pool or a chesty area of a pool. Um, you can sidestep, and each of these works different muscles. Uh, you'll see a lot of people limp and kind of lurch, and your hip abductors, the muscles on the side of your hips, um, become weak in many, many people. And again, here's a step down. Here's somebody um, controlling her trunk while pulling the water up and down. Um, there's the paddles I was talking about. Those open and close by twisting them to create more or less resistance. Um, 
working different muscle groups, pulling across your body, down to the side, and and then you can work. You, you can de-weight your spine here, and you can work on kicking more of an endurance activity, but also your quads and hamstrings. There and there are literally thousands of exercises you can do. This is an exercise you can take from land. Most okay. of my geriatric population would have a hard time with a lunge or a step up, necessarily, or a step over. And so there was the shallow, and then they go back into the deep um, setting there to do the kicks and whatnot. But it kind of gives you a, an idea of, of the generalized medium of the water, how you can use your arms, how you can use paddles, and how you can use different exercises to, to meet your goals. And that's a, that's a smaller pool. Um, the other one's about two and a half times the size of that that we do our wellness in. Um, so as we get started into an exercise program, um, we want to do a warm-up always. And whether that be just a walking activity, it's important before we start strengthening that we've done something to warm up. A, a five-minute uh, excuse me, a five-minute walk, a um, riding a, bi a stationary bicycle, anything that increases your overall temperature of your muscles before we start strengthening is important because we want those muscles to be flexible. We want your body to be warm. We want the blood flow to be occurring before we start challenging you and um, pushing resistance or weights. Functional strengthening. So I like to, to start with functional strengthening for most people because we get to use large muscle groups. And, and most people want, you have to have your large muscle groups to maintain balance and functional mobility, meaning walking, transfers, that if you're in a recliner, you guys ever sit down in a recliner and, in, and you start to lean forward and you kind of fall back into it because it's got a little bit of play in it or it, ro it rocks back and forth and your legs aren't quite strong enough to get out of, out of that or up from a low seat. Biomechanically, the farther, you down, the farther you sit down, the lower the seat is, the more strength you're going to have to have to come up and out of that seat. And so we want to maintain you know, our glutes and our quads and, and, and our balance. And so we do things like squats and we do lunges. Toe and heel raises are really important. Um, stepping up on a box. And again, that can be graded. You can start with a two-inch box or a piece, of, a piece of foam or something in the pool and work all the way up to you know, a 14-inch step um, on each leg so you can step up on something that creates a lot more force and strengthening when you're using it. Um, the great thing about the pool is many of us experience balance issues as, as we're aging and you can stand in the pool and work on single leg balance things um, without the risk of falling. And, and that's imperative for us to improve because every step you take when you walk requires you to have a single leg stance or balance. And most of us do well until there's that little crack in the sidewalk or that little elevation or something's out of the norm. There's a rock that you step on and roll. And, and most of the people we see that have falls is like, oh, it was silly. I just, I didn't see that or I just got a little off balance. And, and, and as we talked about earlier, that can be catastrophic if, if you have a total hip or excuse me, a, a hip fracture, traumatic hip fracture. Um, it allows us to, everything you do in the pool requires you to have some amount of core stabilization by tightening deep abdominal muscles um, during all exercises. Um, I, this is a great slide because we all have a six pack. Um, some of our six packs are just hidden a little bit more than others. Um, but it's, you have to have core stability and trunk control to transfer, to go from sit to stand, to get in and out of bed, to get in and out of your car, um, uh, you know, walk up a ramp. And so, so it's really imperative that, that we work our core, but all body types, no matter what your level of fitness, have the ability to improve and to get stronger. And all of us have the same muscles, we just, some are covered up a little bit. Um, uh, aquatic allows our deconditioned patients to use the healing properties of water, increase motion, increase strength, decrease swelling, improve functional activity and endurance. Again, you, every patient level from somebody who can only take a few steps up to somebody that can walk three miles, four miles, um, can benefit from aquatic therapy and strengthening. And it's just where you start on that continuum. Um, 
the other thing is the aquatic, the aquatic medium allows you to move properly. We don't want to develop improper movement patterns or walking patterns. So if you have knee arthritis and you're limping and now all of a sudden your back's hurting or your SI joint is, is giving you difficulties, um, the, another benefit from aquatics is that you don't have to necessarily, you're able to overcome those improper movement patterns because you're able to walk with a nor more normal pattern and not cause those other issues to develop in your hip or back or another joint related to you compensating or using improper balance. Um, again, some additional benefits to early intervention following an injury, following soreness or following surgery. Um, earlier full weight bearing, less compensation, facilitate proper mechanics, and not have those, those issues develop. Um, so there's a great, um, I, I put this in here, and I, I think people need to really pay attention to this slide, and I put um, the, the, I'm going to leave it up for a minute, um, the website on there. And this is a CDC government uh, physical activity download, um, and it's, it's a comprehensive 126 page program, um, and it goes through the most basic premise of starting exercise, talking to your doctor. There's health questionnaires and surveys. There's a flow sheet and a, a, a log that tells you whether you should just consult with your doctor or you can go ahead and start it. Um, it, it has detailed explanations and progressions of exercise programs. Um, it has um, many other resources. It has detailed logs. Um, for upper and lower body exercises, stretches with pictures showing you exactly the proper form and how to use or how to perform all the exercises. It has a physical activity readiness questionnaire, um, and it really is an amazing, amazing tool that, 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 that's out there for you. And it's um, downloadable, printable, and so you can go and print off logs to follow and track your progress with specific exercises, and it's basically a comprehensive program that will allow you to uh, strengthen and do everything you need to do. So um, please, please make sure and utilize that because I think that you'll find that very valuable no matter what your level of fitness. Um, goals, so there is a goal sheet in that, and it talks about defining your goals. Um, make sure if you want to be successful to define your goals. Make sure you decide what you want to accomplish, what you're trying to, are you trying to um, look good in a pair of leather pants or are you trying to walk out to get your mail? I mean, uh, there's many, many things that, that you can do with strengthening. And so I want you to um, tailor this and define this to you. I want to be able to walk a mile. I want to finish a 5K. I want to be able to go to my grandchildren's ball games. And so if you'll make those goals specific, make them measurable, um, and make sure they're attainable. It doesn't make sense for someone that can't walk their mailbox to say, I want to run a 5K um, initially. You may want to set um, shorter goals. You want them to be relevant and make sure they're time-based. Um, celebrate your success. Um, when, you, when you have an improvement, when you get stronger, when you achieve um, what you need to accomplish, make sure you reward yourself. Um, enroll in a class. Uh, go to a sporting event, go out to dinner, um, celebrate success. We don't celebrate our successes enough. A um, couple exercise tips, make sure you don't hold your breath. Holding your breath will increase um, pressure um, not only on your heart and your inner fecal area, so you don't want to do that. Um, you want to use controlled motion. Um, you don't want to use momentum, kind of like we talked about, about not leaning back. Um, again, log and track it. and. Um, Find activities you like, and then make sure you're stretching post-activity. Um, stretching needs to be performed um, following the exercise. A lot of people stretch before the exercise. Um, it's much better to do a warm-up, do your exercise, and stretch to increase mobility following the exercise um, during a cool-down period. Um, it, it'll improve um, your ability to not have injuries following. There's some good studies out there to say that there is not um, good, good inf there is not good data to, to show that stretching before an event will reduce injury. So um, an active warm-up is better. Um, I threw a couple community resources in there for those of you guys. Um, there are 
a great number of resources out there and available to you. Um, I put three in here that I feel are, are wonderful, that, and, and these are also going to be listed in, in that um, smart tool I gave you. Um, the American Council on Exercise, um, the Arthritis Foundation, um, and, and since so many people have arthritis, this is a great resource and tool for you. Um, the Osteoporosis Foundation, and uh, the 50 Plus Association. Um, so their whole mission of this organization is to promote physical activity for older adults. And so while today is kind of a synopsis and an overview of aquatics and strengthening in, in, in the aging population, um, this is a great resource um, to take along with the other ones I've provided to you and, and tailor your program to meet your needs. Um, I think we're going to open up here in, in a moment and um, answer questions that might have been posed. Um, and here's my contact information. Um, if you have a specific question that doesn't get answered in the question, during the presentation, um, you, you feel free and more than welcome to send me an email and, and I'll get a response out to you. Um, so um, we'll probably open it up uh, with George's assistance here into questions. Yes, we will. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, we do have a question in the queue here, and that is that do you take the participant's blood pressure prior to a pool session? And if so, what is your limit? Okay, um, great question. Um, so for in, in the clinical setting that, that we, we live in, um, all of our patients before they've been able to be in the aquatic setting um, have, have had a comprehensive evaluation and treatment. Um, and so if they have blood pressure issues, that is something that we have access to um, and we'll monitor for somebody that um, has issues. As far as a specific limit, um, Generally, a generally accepted anything over 200 and 100 for systolic and diastolic is contraindicated for exercise. Um, we'll usually talk to people that are borderline or have issues with their cardiologist to clear them and okay them to participate in the aquatic setting um, prior to allowing them to um, start the program. We don't want people coming in and putting additional stresses if, or creating any health issues or problems for them. But it's really a case-to-case -case basis and there's so many factors and variables for each patient there that there's not a specific number. However, we won't put somebody in the pool that's over 200 or 100 for systolic and diastolic in that instance. Okay. Um, is there any recommended limit for anybody that has low blood pressure? Is there any so, indication? That's a great question. Um, the I have not had somebody with a low pr blood pressure issue um, that I've had to address. To be honest with you, let me. I will follow up with you on that. Um, I have another question. Um, for people that are working in a more uh, community-based program setting, um, a YMCA or another kind of facility like that, community center, gym, how do we help people that are doing the training to cross over from land to aquatics? So the nice thing about the aquatic setting is the transition to aquatics is an easy transition. No matter what exercise you're doing, on land, you can almost always carry over or you saw the video where the lady was sitting on the um, uh, noodle and kicking her legs like in a bicycle motion. So somebody that's knees are too stiff that can't maybe make a full revolution on a bike on land can do a bicycling. You could also hold that noodle underneath your arms and let your legs hang down straight and in a deeper water and perform a, a bicycling motion. Um, again, when you talk about the, the benefit of the buoyancy so that we can take anywhere from 50% to 90% of the body weight off, we can do step ups, we can do lunges, we can do kick outs. Um, and if you want, it, at the point where that becomes too easy, at the point where you're able to do 
all of the exercises with, without much difficulty. That's when you need to add the resistive tools in there, and that would be those paddles or a, a foam dumbbell so that we're having to pull resistance um, through the water. And at the point where you can do that, you just you basically can speed up the motion then, create additional resistance and strengthening. And you, we are very, very surprised. A lot of our patients on their first time in the pool will say, this is too easy. And um, we'll say, well, we still only want you to do, you know, these 20 reps or these 30 reps because you might be sore. And say, I won't be sore. And, and quite frequently people will come back to our clinic and say, wow, my muscles were very sore um, from that workout. I was very surprised. Not painful, not joint pain, but they'll have muscle soreness. And, and that's that lactic acid buildup from somebody being able to work harder than, they're not a, than on land where they're not able to push themselves because on land they, the inability to push themselves because of pain or other restrictions. And a lot of people don't exercise properly. Um, you'll see somebody stand um, and uh, I'll use a squat, for example, and they'll stand holding on to something and they'll squat down and, and they'll take their knees way out forward and they'll hold on to whatever's in front of them and they'll drop their butt back and they'll pull themselves up using their arms and momentum and they're not really working the exercise correctly, and, and, but they can't because they're not strong enough or they have too much pain. In the pool, they're able to then de-weight that, but do the exercise through a larger range, recruit more muscle units, motor units and muscle fibers and create more strength. And that's why a lot of times you'll see soreness. So the transition is simply taking a look at your exercises and applying those then against the water medium and then with um, either, like I said, dumbbells, um, ankle weights. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different things. And most, most facilities that have a pool have, have invested in um, those, those um, tools, and especially places that are a little larger, that have bigger pools, that have um, specific programs to an aquatic aqua size. And, and people say, well, I can't do all those things. But you, can, you don't have to use a dumbbell. You can use your hands for resistance as basically a precursor to then getting stronger and tolerating it better and then moving up to the, to the weights. And so it's a great way to, like I said, be active, get stronger, and improve um, muscle strength and endurance. Great. Thank you so much. Um, next question. Is there a different approach, or do you have any recommendations for those people with lymphedema? So the, the lymphedema is a, a very unique um, a pathology, and, and there's a, a, a whole specialty within physical therapy for lymphedema management. Um, sometimes it's – they – the people that treat lymphedema, um, depending upon the patient's other medical conditions, will will limit that. But we don't have a specific different approach um, for those patients in the pool setting. Okay. So do you think that they'd be still able to get into the pool setting under general guidelines, or would it be a case-by-case -case situation? It would be a case-by-case -case situation based upon patients' Um, skin status and um, cardiovascular status and physician um, re release. Okay. Um, I'm just checking. I think we may be wrapping up with a question period. If anybody does have another question, they can definitely send it in. I'll give you Kurt's uh, contact information once again. And if there's no other questions, we will wrap things up. So I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today and for listening in on this presentation and to thank Kurt for the the education and the knowledge that you imparted to everybody and to thank HydroWorks who was in part a sponsor in this session and supported the education that we were able to deliver to everybody. So if you have any questions after the webinar, please do send them in and there will be a survey that comes out for you guys as well so we can continue to bring you great education in our webinar series. So thank you very much, Kurt. Thanks, everybody Thank else, you. for being here.